I do need to move on because quite serious matters news uh, over the weekend. A parliamentary researcher uh, was arrested on suspicion of spying for China. I've got to say, though, um, there's concerns and worries that this might not be the last we see of that. Some uh, security intelligence people think that actually Westminster has been, I quote, infiltrated by a number of operatives. It's got me thinking tonight. Uh, do you think we need to designate um, China as a threat to society? And do if we do, what would that actually look like and what would that mean? I think I've got a guest. I was just about to turn to you, Ben Habib. Oh, no, I don't. I thought I had a guest waiting patiently for me, but I do not. Um, but imminently, I shall be joined uh, by an intelligence historian because I'm fascinated to get his view. But I'm also fascinated as to yours, Ben Habib. So we've got to go back 20 years, I think, to understand the mistakes we've made with China. The principle under Blair's government, adopted by Osborne, was that if we engage with China, if we trade with China, if we inculcate Western capitalist uh, ways of trading and, uh, and living, they will eventually politically and ideologically come over to our way of thinking. And that was a fundamental mistake, the idea that by exporting capitalism, trading with them, we would ideologically get them to believe in democracy, the upholding of the law and everything else that we do. What China did was to completely take advantage of our generosity and preparedness to trade with them. They exploited it to the nth degree. They've done it incredibly well. They've used their security services, their intelligence services, their political establishment, together with private enterprise, they don't have private enterprise, but with enterprise manufacturing, in order to occupy pretty much, uh, okay. you know, the Belt and Roads pl uh, plan, pretty much all the areas of the world which create the resources that they want. They have become the new modern imperial power. And we, the UK, encouraged it. We trade with them. We're so embedded with them now that you get the kind of timid response that we saw from Rishi Sunak saying that he told Li Qiang that we will not tolerate an uh, assault on British democracy. But actually, even 20 years ago, we would have expelled all Chinese diplomats as a result of what's just happened in Westminster. It is a systemic But threat. he's denying... I've got to say, obviously, the guy's denying it. Um, the Chinese embassy in London, they're massively, strongly denying it. Um, and I have to say, I'll just quote them, actually, before I bring you in, James. They're saying, this is the Chinese embassy in London, they're saying, uh, basically, this is all nothing but malicious slander. Uh, they urge relevant parties in the UK to stop their anti-China political manipulation and stop putting on such a self-staged political farce. What do you make to it all? So I agree with Ben that Parliament and Rishi Sunak and their debate and so on was pompous and phony and is not really about the real things. But, I mean, yes, China, I'm sure, of course China has spies in Britain. We have spies in China. The US has spies so in we, Britain. So how do you know? Well, I couldn't reveal my extremely high-level intelli my, my high intelligence sources, but... You know, you would probably be a bit alarmed if we didn't have any spies in China. We would have spies. Well, I? I, don't, I don't know. But anyway, the, the the point is, countries have spies in other people's countries. That's not good, but that is, you know, that is the case. And when we're talking about, uh, you know, Ben was saying, and I can, you know, here we have to disagree, part company, I'm afraid, uh, about you know, China is this new imperial force, etc. China has one military base outside of China. The U.S. has 800. China doesn't have any troops in our country. The U.S. does. It's got it's Ooh. got it's got 10,000. I mean, I, I'm not saying that therefore we should not have uh, relations with the U.S. That would be ridiculous. And in the same way, of course, we're going to have relations with uh, with China. Well, uh, let me bring a third uh, chap into this conversation because joining me down the line now is Rupert Allison, an intelligence historian. Good evening to you. Uh, we've just been hearing uh, in the news bulletin that Oliver Dowden, he's described in Parliament today, China has been, I quote, a systemic challenge to the UK. Do you agree with that? Yes, and long term, that's a reasonable assessment. But I think on the evidence that we have before us today, we can only say that what the Chinese have been indulging in, particularly the Ministry of State Security, is the kind of reconnaissance operations that is characteristic of them uh, undertaking this kind of activity prior to a major espionage uh, organization and network and penetration and 
probably accompanied by an influence operation as well. All of that is very well documented in the United States. So what do you think we should do about it now? Because there's talk about whether or not we should uh, officially designate China a threat. What would that mean? Is there any benefit in that? No. Uh, this is getting tied up in really bureaucracy and legislation. And so the new National Security Act offers this route, which is an alternative to the Official Secrets Act, an alternative to counterterrorism legislation. And it, it, it's very binary and focused, and it is not really appropriate for what we're experiencing today. What should happen is vigilance, and we should be very tough in identifying people who may or may not have been recruited for espionage themselves, or they may not realize that they have been cultivated for that purpose. And if you take an, an innocent soul who perhaps is a researcher in the House of Commons, it may well be that just the information they pick up in the stranger's bar, uh, in the committee rooms, that may be of some value to the Ministry of State Security in the future, particularly when they're looking for weaknesses amongst members of parliament who, God forbid, may express some weakness that could be exploited by an adversary. And there's been criticism as well about James Cleverly, for example, going over to Beijing. Some people are saying we shouldn't have um, friendly ties to China. The flip side of that is other people are saying we need to have more friendly ties. We need to be closer to China because of their power. What say you? Well, I think um, embrace them, but um, keep them close and uh, keep your friends closer still. Close, but your friends closer still. Rupert Allison there, thank you uh, for your insights. Do you agree with that final sentiment? Well, I, I, I don't entirely agree with him. I mean, I think the reason we've got the problems we've got with China is because, as I mentioned earlier, we were too quick to embrace them. We wanted to bring them onto the world stage and we thought we would neuter any threat to our security as a result of trading with them. And that is a fundamentally flawed uh, principle. And what we've now got is an economic arrangement with China, which would be incredibly painful for us to break. We would, see inf we would make the inflation that we've had so far look like a walk in the park if we tried to really break ties with China. We would also find a very hostile China on the other side of the, uh, uh, of the Rubicon, if you like. And we've got this really difficult problem. To say it's a systemic challenge is to totally underestimate the problem that China face, uh, now poses to the United Kingdom. And if you think they've got people in Westminster, Michelle, they've got people in our education establishments, mm. they've got people everywhere. They are, they are setting the debate. Sorry, forgive me. I know you said um, that you're about to lose your voice. You want me to bring in, uh, James, yeah, you can have, do, a, have yeah. a gulp of whatever that, what is that in your cup? It's ginger something or the other. With yeah. the tea bag left in? Yeah. You well, need honey. I think you need some honey in there. That's what we need. I'll try and rustle up some honey uh, in the break for you. But yeah, the language, I found the language quite interesting because Sunak, before he became PM, he did used to talk quite tough about China. Uh, Liz Truss, she used to talk quite tough about them. And then I feel a little bit that now that you've got your, your, your likes of Sunak into the position of power, talk seems to kind of be diluted. Words are kind of quite uh, loose, quite kind of wishy-washy. Where did that sentiment go that Sunak held previously? I mean, it, it's easy to say empty, nonsense, sabre-rattling piffle, which is what Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak and lots of, you know, lots of other so-called China hawks are very, very tough. There's no action. There's no action to take. Our relations with China should be based on mutual respect. Does that mean that, they, you know, should we allow them to have spies in our country? No. But should we completely flip out and say this is a terrible threat and we're under enormous danger because of it? No, not at all. I think everybody should calm down and use less um, over-the-top language, which, you know, as Ben was explaining why, can't actually be linked to any actions. Well, there you go. Mutual respect is what James uh, thinks we need.